thanks for inviting me. It's a great honour to be here. Um, and um, as, as has been said, I work for Hope Worldwide UK. And um, I actually head up the, the two-step programme, the Homeless Services. We house around 20 single homeless people a month in London. It's our 25th anniversary this year. And I do really want you to encourage this is the, our newsletter we've produced to mark the occasion. Um, it's our past present and, and future plans and um, please do read it, take it away and um, pass it on. I do want to also just give thanks and acknowledge all, all the work that, that's gone into making uh, Two Step and, and Hope Worldwide UK what it is today. I think mean, JP was an instrumental in all of that as a David and Amanda Kano, I, I know come here as well. And um, so yes, uh, quick family update. I'm here with Katerina. It's um, our 16th Anniversary in, in October, we've been married and we have two children. Daniel's four and a half, and, and um, no, Natalia's four and a half, and um, Daniel is two. I knew I'd get it wrong, and um, my brain goes too fast sometimes. A quick health update I know, thank you for all those uh, you know, who, who prayed and are concerned. Um, if you didn't know, I was diagnosed with acute leukemia in um, August 2015, and after four months of, of chemotherapy and, and eight weeks in, in hospital. I thank God and, and the NHS, UCH Hospital, I'm in full remission and the chances of returning are very low. So, um, um, the sermon title today is, What Does It Mean to Have Hope? Um, I've been studying the book of Hebrews this year, I know you've done a series in Hebrews in January, February, and um, I want to focus on the theme of hope in Hebrews and what Hebrews has to say about hope and how it relates to the rest of the Bible. I was concerned that perhaps you'd covered all the material already and uh, I spoke to Malcolm and he said, don't worry, uh, well, you haven't, and even if you had, it's good to have a, a, a refresher. And um, so I'm going to look at three um, passages in Hebrews. So as you can see there, Hebrews 6, where hope is described as an anchor for the soul, and we sang the, sang the song earlier. Hebrews 7, which describes our hope in Christ as, as a better hope by which we draw near to God. And Hebrews 10, which talks about some of the practical implications of having this hope. I've got a lot to squeeze in. I know we're running a bit late. I'm going to do my best to finish close. I've got leeway to finish close to 4 o'clock, so a little bit after. And, um, but, so what does it mean to have hope? Why do we need hope? What specifically is the Christian hope? What effect should that hope have in this world? How did Jesus and the church model all of this? And I've learned a lot while preparing this message. It's really challenged my thinking and, and my heart, and I really hope that, that it challenges your thinking and heart as well. Um, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I hope this message motivates you to look into his teaching and encourages you to, to find out more about him and ask questions so that you too can have an eternal hope. So why do we need hope? Life is difficult, as it says at the beginning of a famous book, and even it, for us in the Western world, that applies to us whether we're a believer in God, in, in Jesus, or not. Time and chance happen to them all, it says in, in Ecclesiastes 9. We all get sick, and people let us down, our dreams do not always come true, and ultimately we all die. Um, the Apostle Paul, just to make a cheerful beginning, um, sober it up there. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, these three things remain, faith, hope and love. Um, a life without faith has no meaning. If there's no God, we are just a random accident of nature, a combination of atoms and chemicals and all meaning is an illusion. A life without love isn't worth living and we are made for relationships by a relational God to love and to be love, loved. And, and hope plays a crucial role in that. It's pretty hard to love when you've lost hope. Yeah. According to research, hope is a determining factor in overcoming poverty and overcoming illness. And if our mind is hopeful, it can even change the structure of our brain. Yeah. Uh, life is difficult, but let's be honest, for most of the world, as, even as, we, well, as we've seen and heard today, Life is much more difficult, and a lot of people would love to have some of our first world problems. Yes. And there's many sobering stats, but around 767 million people live in extreme poverty. Um, severe acute malnutrition is a direct cause of death for one million children every year, every single day. 1,000 children under five die from illnesses caused by contaminated water and inadequate sanitation. And God cares about all of these people, all of these situations, and he wants us 
to care as well. He wants us to make a difference. And it's so great to hear today about, about the work that's being done. And so it's, it's, we can sometimes feel overwhelmed by, by the statistics and by the magnitude of, of what's going on. Um, and yet, when we step forward and, and start to do something, it's great to see the difference it makes in the lives of those few and to see that, that effect multiplied. And that's how Help Worldwide began and now operates in 60 countries and, and has served millions of people um, over the years. And God wants, with our blessings, to be able to, to bless others. Um, I like the quote, live simply so that others may simply live. And I think it is a real challenge for us in the Western world. Uh, as Jean and Fabian were talking about in the welcome, there is this pressure from society, from relatives, from advertising and media to, to consume more, to get the new shiny phone every year or every couple of years, to get maybe a new car every three years and, and whatever. And we, and we don't need to buy into that. We can, live, we can choose to live more simply than we can afford to live so that we can then be generous to others and it's great to just to hear about all the work that's, that's being done and that, that you're supporting. So as I say we, um, we're going to be looking at, at hope and how it um, applies in Hebrew. Just a, a brief introduction because I know you support the work in the UK and very grateful for that. Um, this is a video which hopefully is going to play. Alex, is it going to play for me? I've got no idea. It's pretty He's got no idea. Okay, it's always, it's always good when the technical guy says he's no idea. Okay, here we go. Uh, he's on the case. This is the story of someone we helped. It's always been the case when I, when I leave London and I come back, I end up being homeless and it's all about trying to survive and trying to rebuild. First thing I did was I decided to go to McDonald's. It was a 24 hour McDonald's. I started staying there for a while. Uh, there was other homeless people there as well. It was just strange to just see a whole world of homeless people living in McDonald's at night time. And everything was going okay for a while. I met a couple of people, managed to talk to them, find out what they're doing. And it was, uh, it was somewhere where it was survivable because you had the cameras, people working there, police was only around, around the corner. But then things started going wrong, um, just gangs, gangs, lots of gangs in the area. I've never seen so many gangs and there was one particular night when a guy, I felt like a guy was going to be seriously hurt and that changed my whole way of thinking and I decided to move on. And after that, I went to a lot of homeless people go to and they, you can have a shower, uh, have something to eat, uh, you have a doc nurse there. Uh, plus, there is a place where you could uh, they help you to uh, find work, uh, education, and uh, and plus there's a link to being able to find a, a, a place to live. And, uh, so that well, once I went there, things started getting better. I went to see a nurse. My stomach virus finally subsided. Uh, I started getting stronger, getting more confident in myself. And there was an opportunity to work, and I went for it, and uh, I was doing it. But the problem was, while I was doing it, I was uh, homeless. Part, I was actually homeless during the week, and then the weekend I was staying with my friends. So Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday, I'll be homeless, and then from the Friday night until uh, Monday morning, I'll stay with my friends, and that was okay uh, for a while. And I was uh, saving a little bit of money and trying to just get on with things, and. Uh, and then that stopped. And since then, I've just been uh, surviving uh, from actually going to Charing Cross, King's Cross, uh, going from there to uh, Heathrow Airport, <laughs> uh, Terminal 5, uh, lots of homeless people there too, unbelievable, just London just full, full of homeless people. And uh, taking a bus, sleeping on a bus, going to the library, sleeping there. Couldn't do the job anymore because I just couldn't sustain it. Uh, trying to find somewhere to live, couldn't do it. Uh, to be able to connect with all world, worldwide. And uh, right now I'm in a place and hopefully I'll be able to move in. But coming back to being homeless, there's just so many homeless people on the streets. Different stories, different reasons. I don't particularly like, like the idea of seeing homeless people sleeping on every corner of shops and people walking by and giving them a pound or buying them food. Yeah, it's good gesture, it's fine, but it's in the long term, uh, in the long term, it's not really helping anyone. And the homeless scene in London, for what I've seen, seems to be growing, it's not getting smaller. 
But even though I'm about to move into a place, is I'm gonna have to do something and try to see if I can help out in some way. But you know, if you if you want to see homeless people, go to Charing Cross. You know, go to Terminal Five. You know, go to Elephant Castle. You know, just pretty pretty much go around London. You find oh, I'm getting any better. I can say so because I've been out there for several months. I've been out there all night long, seeing it from first hand, speaking to homeless people themselves. Yeah, I'm really appreciative of Oak Worldwide and all the things they're doing. Uh, it's difficult and without, uh, without them, it would be more difficult. And now they never turn people away. They're always open and helpful and willing to help anytime. You can ring them up, you can email them. And uh, just for the fact that, you know, it started off from, from a situation where people just wanted to help. What I would like to say is at least Oak Worldwide is continuing to do the best they can with what they have and they are making a big difference so if there are anyone that's listening to this just i just wanted to say yeah thank you for all the things you're doing and just keep doing what you're doing thank you so thank you um, there are many other profiles and stories in, in here so do do have a read um, of course that's one story and as I said there are thousands but every person we help is, is an individual that God cares about and that we can make a difference um, with their life. What is Christian hope? Um, Christ, Christian hope is, is, isn't just wishing for the best, it isn't a casual hope like I hope it won't rain today or even more or I hope England win the World Cup again. Um, it isn't a precious hope like I hope I don't get cancer or even I hope my cancer is healed. Um, Christian hope is based on the knowledge of the facts about God. Um, a believer knows that their hope is solid because it is grounded in the word of God. We know that God cannot lie. The Christian hope, Christian has a hope that is the assurance of things hoped for, the, the conviction of things not seen, it says in Hebrews 11 verse 1. It's a hope that's a bit like faith, a faith that cannot be moved by circumstances because it depends on God who does not change and whose promises can be trusted. And um, faced with the problems in this world, it's sometimes tempting to pull back, to insulate ourselves, to not get involved emotionally and physically with the pain that others are going through. And that's not the example of Jesus, as, as was shared today. Um, that Jesus had, comp had compassion um, on people. It, it's, it's who he was. Um, so I, I read this book, which really... Um, Help me is um, and by Steve Kinnard, Jesus and the Poor, and um, it says the English word compassion comes from two Greek words, come and pathos, which mean with and suffer respectively. When you have compassion for someone, you suffer with that person. There have been several times that I've been tempted um, to feel hopeless when I feel I fall so far short of who I want to be, there's a temptation to be depressed. And if we're depressed, we're in, no, we're in, we're in no fit state, really, to help anyone else. And um, it, it is a challenging world. It's no wonder that the, the record number of antidepressants being prescribed, for example. And it helps to have a hope outside of this world. And that's what the Christian hope gives us. Without hope in God, I think I probably would be depressed. Um, I, I, I need a hope, personally, that, that there is a better way, that our mistakes can be forgiven, that we can change, that, um, that there is something better after this life on earth, that there is a God who cares for us. And um, some words of hope. Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The Apostle Peter wrote, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though, for now, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. the, the eternal hope we have helps us to persevere and grow through trials and also helps us to have compassion 
on others. In, um, in Hebrews 6.19, this eternal hope that we have is described as an anchor for the soul. And that is the first point. Hope, an anchor for the soul. And um, it's in Hebrews 6.13-19. Let's um, read from there. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying... I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. After, and, and so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. I don't have enough time to go into the hope that was uh, promised to Abraham. That's in Genesis 12, and you can read about it. I want to focus on the last three lines um, there, where it says, We who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. What is hope? To have a biblical hope is to have a sure anchor for the soul. And what is the purpose of an anchor? I mean, I could ask Miko here, as I know he does some sailing. Um, as far as I understand, an anchor stops a boat from drifting when you, when you moor it and um, um, being blown, blown around or with the tide. An anchor for the soul stops us, therefore, from being blown off course or drifting from, from, who, um, from, who, from God and, and from who he wants us to be um, by the trials of life. And, so, and it says, we who have fled to take hold of the hope. So a Christian is someone who is, has fled the world and its values and has an eternal hope in God. I love the message translation as an image of, um, of hope, as an anchor for the soul. In the message it says, We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It is an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all, ex- all appearances right to the very presence of God in Hebrews 6.19. So hope looks forward, anticipating the good that, that is coming to us and it also keeps us secure in the present. And it's very important that we have this hope because the trials will come to us all. Um, personally, after being diagnosed with leukemia, I remember it very well. Two o'clock in the morning, um, the day after my, or the first night, it's, it's a very lonely place to be. Um, there's no one to talk to, you're there on your own. And really praying, praying to God with, with tears. I, I didn't want to die. I didn't want to leave my wife behind, my child, um, unborn baby. And as I prayed, though, I was, I was comforted by the hope that God could work and was working through it all, that there was an ultimate hope. And I was tempted to doubt. I mean, it helped. I've, I've studied evidence for God and, and science and the resurrection and who Jesus was and why God allows suffering. It, it, it did help. It was still a challenge, but it did help. And if you're going through a difficult time at the moment, there is hope. God is there. God is working. He cares. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But there is hope. And what is this hope, though? Um, I think there is some confusion the, uh, in the world today that the cultural understanding, so what, what most people in, in our culture believe, is that people, um, people die and, and then their souls go to heaven for eternity. Um, I look, this is one of, the, one of Natalia's Bible story books, and this is how it portrays it. Obviously, it's a very pale imitation. This is, this is basically a, p- a pictorial representation of... of Revelation 5. And some people I know um, don't find this particularly appealing. They think that maybe it's like, a, like an eternal worship service. Now, I'm sure it would be incredible any, it is to be in the, the presence of Almighty God. And, uh, and uh, I never tire of, of, of that. And yet, um, is there something more? Um, there it says, you will be with Jesus forever in heaven. I mean, that's the, the passage is Revelation 5. And if you turn to Revelation 5... Um, you can see where this, some of this imagery comes from. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, it talks about 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp 
and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song uh, about Jesus, the Lamb of God. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Okay, it says they will reign on the earth. That's interesting. Um, when you go to the end of Revelation, um, it says some more. And I've been reading a lot about this, if you, you could, about what really happens when we die. It's very important to know. Um, and we can never fully understand, obviously. But there's some great books there. Uh, so Jack, we wrote a great one. Um, Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright is excellent. And, and John Eldridge, um, All Things New. Um, so I just want to talk um, a, a little bit about them and, and share some scriptures. In Isaiah 65, verse 7, and thanks to Jesus and the sacrifice he made on our behalf, we can all draw near to God, as Elliot was sharing about in, in the communion. How is that going for you? And how is it going in terms of doing that with others? We know Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Um, and we can draw near to God individually with whatever helps us to do that. Prayer, reading, his word, um, going to quiet places, music, silence. Um, I remember when I was going through treatment, music really helped me a lot. It's great hearing the, the, the being part of the service today and hearing all the songs and, and how they, they, they linked into, into the theme and, and help us as we close our eyes perhaps and really meditate and, and imagine what the, the truth of what we're, we're singing. Um, how's it going in terms of... Um, in terms of collectively and drawing near to God. The early church, if you read the book of Acts, you read the early church prayed and, and worshipped together a lot. They lived in community. And it's great to hear about um, all your location services and, and the different groups and different things. Um, in, in our region in North London, one thing that bothered me is we, you know, we had lots of teaching and things, but we talked about what we should be doing, but we didn't have time to, to, to specifically pray together as a church. And we didn't have time where we just... I say just work where we really focused on, on worship and I, I, it was something that was on my heart. I brought it up with the leadership team and, and others had that conviction as well and, and, and now we, we have a, a worship service every month where we pray together and, um, which, is, which is great. Also at Hope, um, we need strength um, from God. We have devotionals every morning where a different person shares what they've been learning, maybe what they've been struggling with, how they've been growing and it's so easy to get discouraged or jaded for our hearts to become hard. And it's important that we, that we can connect with one another and help one another to draw near to God. That you can think that everyone's fine, yeah. but, but everyone, everybody struggles. And as has been said, everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Thanks to the hope we have, we can draw near to God. And I want to encourage us all to do that so that we can hear from God and get the strength and direction to go out mm -hmm. and give hope to others. Yeah. Um, final point, hope that leads to good deeds. Therefore, brothers and sisters, this is um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God, with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. That Jesus is our great high priest and, and he sacrificed himself so that, that we can draw near to God. Jesus taught that the greatest commandment was to love God and to, to love your neighbor as yourself. And he didn't just teach it, he modeled it. Again, from this book, Jesus and the Poor. Jesus didn't do love, he was love. Jesus didn't do compassion. He literally suffered with people. Serving others is not something we do, it's who we are as God's people. Evangelism isn't something we do, it's who we are. The gospel isn't something we do, it's who we are. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. In the Amplified Version it says, let us consider and give, give attentive, 
continuous care to watching over one another, studying how we may stir up to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. Jesus is the master of this. I love the story in Mark chapter 9 when he dealt with the disciples. They'd been arguing on the road about who was the greatest. Um, obviously Jesus is the greatest. Um, and, um, and, you know, well, who are they compared to him? They're just completely missing the point. If it was me, I would have said, what's the matter with you guys? What were you doing? And you're like, you're supposed to be humble, don't you get it? And you're arguing about who's the greatest. But, but Jesus just let it go. Presumably he, he thought about it. Presumably he prayed about it. He got them in the room. And in Mark 9, 33, it says, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the, in the house, he asked them, what, are you, what were you arguing about on the road? And you can imagine that. They just kind of look at their, look at their feet like, oh, well, who's the greatest? Oh, you know, and, uh, and it's just really embarrassing. But they kept quiet, as it says, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last. And the servant of all, he took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. He was so effective. He began with a question. He, he prepared a kind of object lesson, a visual thing for them to get it. And I really appreciate Malcolm putting together podcasts and different things to help some of those that helped me to put this, this message together. Um, are there things on your heart? Are there things that, that you can encourage others to do? Um, is it something that you consider? I've got a little book and things that I think I really need to talk to this person about this and, but I'm, I'm going to pray and think about how to bring it up and, um, and um, so yes, Two Step began when, when Walter Evans spoke to JP and said let, you know, that, that's kind of, that it started in the kind of an idea then let's go and, and sleep out on, on the streets and get to identify with the homeless then late, a few years later some research was done and then, and then things started but, but, but it needs that spurring on um, or that initiative to, to do something and it's great to talk there's so many things you can again uh, there's something with Obi in the in the newsletter where he did something with his company um, and um, the Good Samaritan as, as Tudu mentioned um, his the Jesus challenge was to go and do go and do likewise to show mercy and um, what does that mean for you we've looked at three things today uh, three points um, what is the meaning um, got my own title. What does it mean to have hope? And um, three points, hope, an anchor for the soul, hope by which we draw near to God, and, and a hope that leads to love and good deeds. Um, I hope we want to help people, hope worldwide, we want to help people to have an eternal hope, to give them hope for now, but also eternally, and, and encourage that we've been able to be part of um, someone's spiritual journey and I just want to share with this story which kind of ties everything together it's a story of, of someone who who was homeless and uh, George a member of our church in London was reading the Bible in a cafe and um, Peter that's not his real name but Peter uh, noticed uh, and came up to him he'd been looking for people who were true Christians George invited him to sit with him found out he found out that, that Peter was homeless and um, introduced him to Kristen I mentioned earlier who works for hope so that he could get some help and we were able to, to help him to get into a night shelter provided by a network of churches, uh, which is one of our, our partners. Um, he continued reading the Bible, started going along to church and meeting up to study the Bible. And George prayed with him that he could find somewhere to live close to the church. And, and we prayed that with him as well. And God answered that prayer and he moved in somewhere within walking distance of the church meetings a week after his prayer. He was still anxious though about moving into a new area and all the changes and, and at one point he almost abandoned the, the flat but the, the brother said to him, don't worry, you're part of a family now. Um, and the church members helped him to settle into the area and he was, he was baptised shortly afterwards and became our brother in Christ and now he's, he's just so joyful. He's practising with the worship team, he's looking into getting back to work, he's um, very grateful and is encouraging others. So what does it mean to have hope? We have an eternal hope, a renewed creation, an anchor for the soul. And because of this hope, let's draw near to God, encourage one another, and spur one another on towards love and good deeds so that we can give people hope for this life and the next. Amen. Amen.